All right. Welcome back to another episode of Friends from Work, a podcast about all things in the Marvel Cinematic Universe. And it's a podcast that's hosted by me, Kyle Skonowill, and him, my longtime friend from work, Robert Earl. Robert, good morning. I'm on the West Coast, so it is truly morning for me. If mm. you hear the depth of my voice, that's what that is. <laughs> Every so often we get on this podcast and there are just certain episodes that I am going to pick my hill to die on. And today is that day. I am coming in despite my low voice guns absolutely a blazing. I'm like <laughs> I'm I'm going to be like rocket on the back of Groot just ah! <laughs> that's me. <laughs> After this rewatch of Moon Knight. So I just wanted to set the precedent there. I'm not really looking to have my opinion changed today. So I'm not coming in open for discussion. This is really okay. just I have to shoot my shot and tell you how I'm feeling about this. I, I'm just a yes man. <laughs> you can give your own opinion. It's just not changing mine. OK, I no. I, I'm I'm looking forward to this. Uh, I feel like I said this last week, I guess, but Moon Knight is one that. I've never quite been able to figure out what the consensus is. Like uh, it, I feel like when it was coming out, we were all enjoying it. And then I remember there was a moment like always happens around the finale where people were like, eh. and then multiverse of madness came out at the same time. And then that was like a big, like it, it kind of just overshadowed the conversation. I remember us talking about that on the podcast. And then since then, I feel like I've seen some people which is unique among Disney Plus shows. Like, I feel like they're most shows are not quite this polarizing unless there's some kind of like She Hulk trolling element going on. But this is one where I feel like over time, a lot of people have hated on it more and more. But at the same time, other people have elevated it to like one of their favorite things that, that Marvel has done in the Disney Plus era to the point where for our friendly awards, Last year, Moon Knight cleaned up like no That's contest. Right. I haven't seen a lot of the hate, so I'm thankful for that. I have three things I want to share with our audience briefly about my time in California that I think you'll enjoy. I am yeah. here right now in Napa, California, looking at some rolling hills out my hotel window. Oh, three man. funny things. First of all, I got to say, I had the best burger and tots of my life. I'm willing wow. to say that. Of my life, wow. I went to this place called Rustwater Kitchen and Tap Room where they only have, you know, it's one of these places with four different burgers, tots or fries, that's it, and then beers. And oh, that's it, nice. It was the freshest, hottest tots with the nice seasoning, crispy, and then mm. just a double cheeseburger, pickle, onion, tomato, sauce, um, just unbelievable. Unbelievable. Best wow. burger I've ever had. Second story. I brought this up on a Friends from Work Plus episode, but because of my long flight out here and I have a 40-minute commute through these hills, like over this mountain, to get to go to get to the golf course, mm -hmm. uh, I've been listening through the entire journey through the MCU playlist. And I wanted to give a plug on the main feed. If you want to get mm. your mind right for the MCU before these rewatches, at minimum, go look up our journey through the MCU playlist that Robbie put a ton of time curating on Spotify. Too and at time? minimum, maybe, but listen to the project we're about to watch before that. Mm. Um, but if you have the time, like I do, if you have whatever it is, I don't know, 10 hours, uh, it's just a fun playlist to let roll. It allows you to kind of sit with your thoughts. It takes you back to certain places um, in the MCU and where you were when you saw those projects. And just in general, uh, if you want more of that, you can check out Friends from Work Plus because we just are going to be diving into that soon over there on the, on the bonus Friends from Work Plus feed. But, dude, it's so good and... I'm just reminded of how good the music of the MCU actually got starting around, you know, 2013, 14 in particular. Mm -hmm. It just really ramps up. And I've really enjoyed a lot of the phase four stuff. 
Michael Giacchino's Love and Thunder, which we'll be talking about next week, has made a big <sighs> jump in my book. I, I've been listening to it a ton. You know how I feel about like the Black Widow soundtrack and then mm-hmm. what Christoph Beck has done with Ant-Man. But that's not to mention all the classics. And then Hasham Nazi absolutely kills the Moon Knight soundtrack as well. So much choir work on that. That's really cool. Um, yeah. Very choir influenced. And then lastly, Robbie, I had a first in my life. So I'm driving back from the golf course and you have to go down this mountain. It's really beautiful. There's two ways to get home, go on the highway around the mountain or go over the mountain. Uh And it's really twisty. We're talking like two lane road, 25 miles an hour down the, down the highway. Well, I get all the way down and I get around a corner and I kid you not, I've never had this happen on the road fire. I pull up to a forest fire. A wildfire. Like the ones you read about in the books, I come around a corner and the side of the hill is on fire. All the, all the, So much so that two things. I felt the heat in my car. I'm like, oh my gosh, I don't think this is like a bonfire gone wrong. Like the whole side of the hill is on fire. Jeez. I, I've never experienced it. That's so crazy. The, so the next 10 minutes, I have no service, but I'm driving away from it thinking, do I call 911 for this? I've never been in this situation. But I feel like, I'm like, I don't think this is some guy like burning crops. This is like, I think something's accidentally on fire. And by the time I decided I'm going to call 911, which I've never done, uh, I saw emergency vehicles coming the other way. And the next day they were still there putting it out. And so it is out. Wow. It's out. But I just, I've never witnessed a wildfire and I drove next to it on accident. So there you go. That's crazy. That's my, my three California takeaways. Also, gas is $5.80 a gallon mm. here. I literally have no idea how people survive. Like, legitimately, <laughs> how do you afford $5.80 gas and $3,000 rent in San Francisco? Well, that's why people are, are going the Sconewall route with the electric cars. <sighs> Amen. Hey, drive electric. Hey, don't get me started on my EVs. I'll, I'll go for a long time. <laughs> no, I'm with you. Uh, I was actually looking. Uh, Subaru came out with one this year that... That's kind big of Subaru to me. guy. Big, big Subaru, Subaru guy. guy. Uh, Anyways, that is my California stories. Go ahead. Well, one, I just thought about this because you were talking about calling 911. Um, I won't get all the way into this, but I was telling you before we started that Candace and I had some like plumbing issues oh. with like a potential roof leak and all this stuff. We finally got rain for the first time in like actual, you know, like rain that was more than 15 minutes. Uh, for the first time in forever in, in Austin. And for the that first was great. time in forever. <laughs> but then, uh, you know, of course, we started seeing this bubble from the ceiling and oh, all no. of the bad stuff that comes with that. But we were calling someone because it was like 9 p.m. on a weekend. And um, we went to a website, like, a you know, one of these like 24-7 plumbers in Austin. And Candace like on their website called their like, you know, you have a plumbing emergency. Here's the number to call. (laughs) And she clicked it. And then of course they answer and they're like, Hey, you know, this is the emergency line. What's the situation. And she spends like two and a half minutes, you know, doing the kind of introductory. Here's what happened. Like, here's where we are. This is what we were hoping you can do. And then there's a pause. And the woman on the other end goes, ma'am, this is an emergency room. At a hospital. Is this a oh, medical emergency? Oh, no. <laughs> and it was not like, it was not Candace's error. It was some weird thing where Wait, the it, wrong like, number links? was. Yeah, like it was from their website. And I, I don't know what happened, but uh, it was like, it was a very, one, it was a jarring moment. And then I was trying to imagine what this woman that's like dealing with any number of actual medical emergency <laughs> calls is thinking while well, she like patiently waits. Sir, this is a Wendy's? <laughs> <laughs> Michael Scott, uh, can, I, can I talk to Wendy? <laughs> <laughs> we should have just gone with it. Like, yeah, you know, if, if you have anyone at the yeah. hospital. And does it, does anyone there know how to fix the roof? <laughs> Can they come down here? Have you ever uh, called 911 in real life? I never I have. I have not called 911. Okay, me either. No. I, I'd love uh, to hear listener stories of people who had to call 911 and for what. Although that might not be funny. I'm not laughing. I just am curious what right. the situation was. Yeah. Anyways, no, that is, I've never thought about here. that. But uh, The other thing before we jump in that I wanted to talk about. 
I think last week we we talked about the rumor that that Sam Raimi was being mm-hmm. eyed for the the director role mm-hmm. for Secret Wars. There was another rumor that Greg of the Water Cooler uh, mm-hmm. shot our way that I wanted to to talk about for just a second before we jump into Moon Knight. By the way, in case I forget. We've really benefited from the work Greg's been doing in compiling mm-hmm. the stuff and sifting through what's actually worth listening to and reading. And so if you enjoy these little segments, uh, he's he's great about boiling it all down to the the real mm-hmm. gist of it over on our uh, our newsletter. So if you are not a a friends from work patron, or a paid subscriber, no worries. That is free. Uh, the yeah. easiest way to do that is via our Substack. So Good you point. can head over there. You can also get some free posts via Patreon, but that's really, it's not as great of a of an interface uh, for free content as, as right. Substack is. So plug let's, in clar- let's, let's clarify that. You don't have to be a Friends from Work Plus subscriber to go to that website and get a free newsletter, which if you want to stay in the loop with the MCU is the way to do it. And a little bit oh, of yeah. information from us too. So, Oh, yeah. No, well, and, and we're always kind of building that out and, and including more information. It's becoming a great way of sort of forecasting the week yeah. ahead. The newsletter oh. normally drops on Sunday. So there will be some, some – fun recommendations from uh, FFW folks like me and Kyle and Pete and Candace has done one before and Greg, uh, but then also the the news. And there are more written things coming out throughout the week, some of which are also free. So if, uh, if you do subscribe, again, I think Substack is the best way just because that whole platform is kind of built around these newsletters. Uh, you can go there, no cost, and just kind of get all the the extra MCU content you would want. But anyway. The rumor. Yes. uh, So apparently there is is speculation that Deadpool 3 Mm -hmm. is now going to be the Infinity War to Secret Wars Endgame. And King Dynasty will get canceled? I don't know what what that means for King Dynasty. Uh, because obviously, if we're looking at the precedent, we had Avengers Infinity War and Avengers Endgame. So it would be kind of weird to have Avengers King Dynasty and that not be the like first half of whatever story that is. Hey, I'll toss this out there. I'm okay with a three-part Avengers closing for this if you wanted to separate yeah. it into three separate chunks. Well, here's what I'll, I mean, I, I was thinking about this. There are so many rumors swirling around that Deadpool movie, some of which we've already talked about here, but I I think that it could be, maybe, I don't know, I, this is not the rumor, this is just my own conjecture, but I almost wonder if it would work out as like the Civil War to Endgame, where it's like, and you could argue, you know, people talk yeah. about Civil War being like Avengers 2.5, but it also like really sets the table for a lot of what we get in Infinity War. And I think it's like, as we're, we've talked a lot about interest waning or waxing at various times through Phase 4 and now coming into Phase 5. And I will say, one, I think any time that you have a movie come out that has Avengers in front of it, when there hasn't been one since 2019, it's going to be big. But I think if you can proceed that even with a movie like Deadpool that is definitely going to get people in theaters, whether or not they're invested in the MCU, because beyond the Wolverine and Deadpool of it all, there's also all of these other like Jennifer Garner cameos and who knows what else from past Marvel projects. If you can get people in the theater for that, it's a really fun movie and it also has some like real impact on the multiverse saga, then I think you could wind up with, with some kind of all time infinity war level hype heading into this finale in a way that I think that, you know, would be hard to recapture. We always said that it was going to be hard to recapture what happened in 2018, but I think it could be a really nice way of just like syncing people up, pulling people back in that maybe got lost or overwhelmed along the way and then 
setting the stage for those final two movies or final movie to be as big as they possibly can be. Yeah. First of all, I've never seen Deadpool one or two, which is shocking to people. I'm sure we'll cue that. (laughs) But Robbie and I have been talking about when to unveil that watch because I think that'll be fun (laughs) to go through that Mm -hmm. with me having never seen it. Um, Yeah, I think I totally agree how they handle the next few years is going to be really, really important for the future of the MCU and Marvel. They have a chance to, with Deadpool, with Kang Dynasty, with Secret Wars, like you said, build up the hype as if it is Infinity War and Endgame again. But then Mm -hmm. that's your last shot, in my opinion, at really getting all of the rights and the property stuff settled so that whatever we are left with after Secret Wars is what you want it to be. Because we're not doing multiverse mm-hmm. stuff anymore. And we're not going to just bring people in via a portal from a different universe. So wherever yeah. we're left at that point, that's the characters you want to cover the next five years. So we got to get that correct. I think that's right. Okay. Well, let's get into a Moon Knight rewatch. I am absolutely jazzed and loaded with notes here. So like I said, guns a blazing. Let's get into Moon Knight after a quick word from these sponsors. Na 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 Moon Knight. <laughs> and by the way, if you are just finding this podcast, please check out our comics provider, organicpricebooks.com, on that written yeah. newsletter, as an example, or on Friends from Work Plus, or on our Discord channel, which is also free and we've been utilizing a lot more recently. Mm-hmm which you can find on our website, the FFWpodcast.com. You can join our Discord channel. Robbie's been sharing some specific comic readings. And as we get closer to Halloween, there's going to be some specific non-MCU type comics available that we're going to be pointing out specifically that you can go to Organic Price Books and get them. Uh, so we'll be talking about that more in depth. But yeah, they 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 mail you on time, very, very, very high quality comics for mm-hmm. very cheap. Just a great company, great uh, smaller company to support. We love organicpricebooks.com. Okay, Robbie, here's the thing. I don't know if you have notes for Moon Knight. I had rewatched it about six months ago, and then I rewatched it again this last week uh, with mm-hmm. the audience with the finale on Thursday. And my opinion hasn't changed. For me, it's the second best Disney Plus show right behind WandaVision, ahead of Loki. And I have like, let's see, one, two, maybe four or five extremely positive overarching points. And then I'll give my two little caveats at the end after multiple rewatches. How do you want me to do this? You want me just to start hitting you with with topics? Yeah. Yeah. I've got I've got really one thing that I want to talk about and uh and I'm sure I will think of things as you start talking but I'm going to let you uh I'm going to let you drive today. Okay. I'm liking this energy. Okay, point 1. Ethan Hawke and Oscar Isaac are absolutely spectacular. We Agreed. have talked about how spectacular they are in other projects too and what would that be like bringing them over and in my opinion, it absolutely does not disappoint. And I'm going to stop saying in my opinion because you know it's my opinion. But it is <laughs> – it's it's captivating for me. I can't mm-hmm. look away from their conversations and I never feel like it lulls. What Oscar Isaac is doing with the multiple versions of himself and how he's making them different and then some of mm-hmm. the physical acting – of him being sedated and drugged or like his face sagging because he can't talk like that. Like all of that is so, it's such a character deep dive with his acting. Mm -hmm. I just don't feel like we've had a case study like that maybe ever. And I can't look away from how he's performing that. Like the sadness in a really random scene, right? Like when he goes to that steakhouse and orders the steak, the good bit. Like, it's supposed to be kind of funny because Steven's a vegan, but it's also so heartbreaking that his Mm -hmm. life is falling apart, and he portrays that perfectly, and even how he looks off the waiter. I'm pointing out really little details, but 
it is, I can't turn, I can't turn away. And I think Ethan Hawke is the perfect counterbalance to that. Playing this character that has so much calm and patience and reserve while Oscar Isaac is kind of playing this frantic DID person. Yeah. And then he being this all wise hero and you don't have to resort to violence. And it's mm-hmm. so like weird, creepy, culty. The performance of those two is my point number one at why I think this show is above a lot of – honestly, it's the reason why this show is above Loki for me because I think there are some dips in some of the performances that I can look away in Loki. Not that I'm here to compare the two, but mm-hmm. I can't look away at any moment with these two in particular, and I'm going to point out another thing in a second. Wow. Yeah, no, I think I agree with that. Those two performances have always stood out to me really within the entire MCU as just being, aside from their quality, just really unique in what they're doing. So I I, I agree. I don't, I I need to think about whether that is the case with every, I guess that's the case with, with pretty much every actor. Like there, I don't, I don't know that Moon Knight's one where I have a problem with any side characters Uh, Well, this is my second point, which I guess wasn't going to be point two in order of importance, but I was going to follow up on it later. I wanted to specifically isolate Mae Calame as well. So, oh, yeah, she absolutely rules. And I feel like it's wild that we're not talking about her more. I feel like the reception to her should have been the same level as Kate Bishop, the way people kind of got going on how Kate's a perfect addition. I feel like it was at the time. Do you? I feel like it's it's lost. Well, I think the difference is just that um, Kate Bishop is an existing Marvel character that that has a big following, whereas what they're doing with Layla, like they're it, it's based on kind of a, a combination of characters, but there's not a following there. I don't care. I don't care what but, the past history was. I'm just saying well, no, what I'm she's just saying, doing. Well, I'm, I would just argue that you're wrong. And that people were excited about it. <laughs> See, I could be forceful too. I'm not always diplomatic. Someone told me the other day. Someone was like, I, "Someone asked me what I what I had." It was just the, does not matter to the context at all. But someone was asking how a conversation went, and they were like, "Oh, I'm sure you handled it dipl- diplomatically as always." You know, classic <laughs> Robbie. And I was like, "Wait, what does that mean?" I just so got no. chills. I got chills. You terrified <laughs> me there. I was so not expecting that. What in the no, world? I just think that because I remember at the time that was one of the things people were revved about. And I should say to the point where they now have they have incorporated that character into Marvel Comics because of the buzz around the hey, around the show. Don't take out your other life frustrations on me here. OK, just because I said that. <laughs> Apparently, there's some deep rooted insecurity on Robbie not being forceful enough. Jeez. <laughs> Yeah, this is the uh, this is the the banner Hulk you did battle you out. see in there. So Ethan Hawke, Oscar Isaac, and May Calame are all spectacular. Point number two, then I'll throw those together. Mm-hmm. I think I have this so high on my preference ratings because I just love and cannot get enough of this genre of shows. I don't mean the monsters as much, but the I just remember watching it thinking, oh, my gosh, the MCU is finally doing Shutter Island or like oh, this, yeah. this like thriller, borderline creepy, but you absolutely cannot guess what's going on. And then to take steps where it goes even beyond that, where whatever you think could be happening, they do a twist that's beyond that. And then like just the genre of constantly being on edge, that's mm-hmm. my favorite kind of thing. Like that combined with the Nolan trying to guess what's going to happen. And I'm not saying it's that degree of twistiness, but I just love being in this genre. So point number two for me is, yeah, is that I I have a hard time looking away for that reason. Is there anything else in the MCU that even approaches this genre? No. I, I mean, people talked about Multiverse of Madness being on the creepier side, but it's still not as much the like guessing what's going to happen twisty side. Hmm. Like mess yeah. with your mind. Mess with your mind is the way to say it. Right, right. I think that's right. Point number three, and I'll just keep going. I love it. I think that the ending of episode four is the single best twist in Disney Plus history. 
and it would be up there in the MCU best twists history ever. Uh, I still will never forget where I was when I saw that, and I'll never forget the fact that that's what you had been sitting on for a month because we got four <laughs> screeners to this, and I didn't finish the fourth episode. So I was still in the tomb for a month before we caught <laughs> up in real time, and then I saw the end of that episode, and I just remember saying to you, in a hotel, actually, I was traveling, I remember saying, oh, my gosh, that's what you've been sitting on? <laughs> That is well, like and the we had to do the spoiler me. free preview. And yeah. so we were talking about like the because I think that they made a point to send out four episodes, which is really a lot for a six episode series. That's not Time. normal. No. And I think it was because they did want people to know that there was a, a whole other layer to this beyond even what you got in those first two. And so I was trying to get that across. One, I mean, we would have to do that anyway without spoiling things for listeners, but also without spoiling things for you. Although that would be a really hard thing for someone to guess, to your point. Well, there's layers to it for me. The fact that he he gets shot. I just remember thinking like, oh, gosh, like we don't often see our heroes just get shot and actually right. take take the bullet. Then the actual cinematography and editing of him falling backwards into the water in like mm -hmm. a slow motion. And I'm thinking, what is happening? He's falling to the water like he's got to get healed here. Oh, no, Kanchu's not here. He doesn't have that. Then right. the shot of him like fading into the water. A and that's where like it starts switching. It's like crossing over to another mm -hmm. life. And then when it wakes up. I mean, there, there's not a more genius way to reveal the reveal than having that, like, 80s-style show be the first thing oh, you see. Yeah. Like, if, if the first thing you saw was the psych ward, that'd be amazing. But it would not get close to encapsulating the way the light comes on from the flashlight. And then mm -hmm. for—I'm not kidding. I have chills right now. For about 30 seconds, I legitimately was thinking, what am I watching? Did my Disney Plus glitch? Like, I don't know, because it goes to black, and then it just comes up with right. this other thing. And I'm like, am I watching the wrong thing? Did they send me the wrong file? Did I accidentally click on something? I could not figure <laughs> out what was happening. And then it goes like 30 seconds before he says, Stephen Grant. And to reveal it that way, that it's mm -hmm. a name, I have chills right now. And then the whole zoom out and pan through the psych ward and seeing all these characters and landmarks that Steven had witnessed in his real life. And you start thinking, what? It, was this all fake? Was this all just in right. a, a game for him? Those are my favorite kinds of twists. And I thought it was executed so brilliantly that mm -hmm. alone, just that twist alone, makes this show a top one or two shows for me ever on Disney+. Plus. Wow. Yeah. I think one thing that I really appreciate that Neil on our Discord pointed out, there, there are so many things happening in the show that are never really fully explained. Like, you never know quite what is real and, like, what that psych ward even represents and the significance of moments within that – to real, quote-unquote, real-world uh, events. And so I like that I like that it sits in that because I think back to the, the comic that primarily inspired at least that portion of the, of the series. And I think that that was sort of the case there. You know, it's this... It, it's a genius way of subverting a, a superhero comic and then now a superhero TV show in that... Clearly, it's all ludicrous, right? It, it, it's like a we're we're talking about like super heroes that are like the on the one hand like as guardians or like here someone that's been recruited by an Egyptian god, and so whenever you have a moment for that person to then have to explain what their life is and what they do in the context of a psych ward. It's like, oh, yeah, no, this is – I could actually see this being just one exploration of this guy's fractured psyche or 
this is like something else that's it's some kind of sinister thing and everything we've seen out in the real world is totally real or it's some kind of combination of the two and you walk away not totally sure what is what down to the actual post credit scene which I said when we were rewatching the other night is I think one of the best in the MCU period in terms of just execution what I want I, I think we we listed it as one of the best whenever we did our our um, rankings of credit scenes over on Friends from Work Plus because it 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 does what you want where it's like a it, it goes back and grabs something from what you've just seen and expands on it, but then it also dangles something that you want to then kind of follow into the future. And so I, it's also a, when was Jake there? Was it like just those moments when Mark and Steven both couldn't account for it? How often has Jake been the one working for Conchu versus Mark? And then the big question being like, is this going to be something that we that we move forward with or not? Because I think that one of the things about Moon Knight that's different than any other project is it finished and there was this kind of like, yeah, and that might just be it. Or, you know, maybe Moon Knight gets folded in. But it's like it, the whole project is just more comfortable than any other I can think of in the the MCU with just being a question mark. And I I love that element of it. Let's sit in that for a second longer. I thought you brought up some really good points. At first, when I watched this, and I still think this to this day, it would be really fun to have the director on and specifically see if he could lay out a linear version of what we are seeing because mm -hmm. there is some intentionality behind the little visual cues while that's going on. It's like one time Mark Spector's there and he has like a broken nose as if – when he did try to run out, he did get sedated. Like that really happened, right? right? But then sometimes it comes back and his face is totally healed. Or sometimes mm -hmm. it comes back and Harold's bleeding on his feet. And so I would love to see if there was an actual attempt to be like, okay, with well, this time when he comes back, it's actually happening like this. But after I thought about that a lot, while that still would be fun, I think mm -hmm. now after three rewatches or four rewatches, I'm okay with it being ambiguous. It's a Chris Nolan thing where I don't think you're supposed to exit the show thinking I know exactly how that was going down. And I think there's some beauty yeah. in that a little bit. I really do. It's not like an intentionally like mess you up so that you get frustrated. It's, it's, a look into a guy who has a fractured mind and some of that stuff's right. not going to be explained. And the takeaway is supposed to be learning about this character, not necessarily from that point on what is literally happening step by step. Yeah. So I could try to explain it, but I don't know that I have the answer and I'm okay with that. Can I point out one thing just as you were talking about the fractured psyche, it reminded me of this that I noticed, I, I think for the first time on this watch it it's not a plot thing it's it's more just you know we've talked about how these rewatches you you just kind of seize on on different elements and one thing that i really appreciated and that kind of hit me emotionally on this watch is how much mark has been caring for steven and protecting him like as his little brother like and, and we've talked about you know that's clear in in the the fifth episode kind of what's happening but then re -watch, like watching the entire series from that perspective it's so different than i think the i don't know if it would be stereotypical but like the expected approach here which would be mark being like oh my gosh like i can't believe the steven guy like i'm just trying to like we're we're having this like battle over the same body and you do have those moments as it goes on and like Steven is is falling for Layla and all that but I like that behind all of it it's not that like Steven is a thing that Mark is trying to get rid of or is frustrated by Steven's like a, a personality that he actually has a lot of care for and love for and is trying like this entire thing is not meant to like hurt Steven, it's the opposite. Like he has to 
do all of these things as Moon Knight for Khonshu as part of his obligation. And Stephen feels like he's been dragged into something and that it's not fair to him. But really, it's that like Mark is doing everything in his power to just like section off this like safe space. And I that is a really unique. I mean, it's a unique format regardless, but I just feel like that takes a character that I think at first blush could be kind of standard action guy as Mark Spector and then really adds a lot of depth where like I, I've, I've heard Oscar talk a lot about how he really loves playing Steven because there's so much to that character. But I think that he kind of sells himself short on how he plays Mark. Like, I think that that character is a lot more complex than I initially thought, I guess, at least on my first watch or two. Well, that leads me perfectly into my next two points, which is it's a perfect, as far as I can tell, look at DID, the disorder. Mm. And we just don't get that. I mean, that's not that's not something you just get on any show you turn on real quick. Right. I mean, people have definitely explored with other mental health related things, but to go so in depth with that, which is my next point, just the emotional weight is so heavy here. And Mm -hmm. I think I've said this so many times before, once you become a parent, I think it becomes even heavier. The, the mistreatment from his mom and how much it hurts mm-hmm. me watching it that it's like, you're, you are you can't treat him like that. Like, he's going through stuff, too. And I'm watching it, like, almost sick to my stomach. Mm-hmm. So the look at how DID could be created from this much trauma and right. having that happen in a Marvel show, I can't emphasize that enough. It's, it's, it's important and it's unbelievable. Like it's so well done. I never feel like it gets shortchanged and it leads Mm -hmm. to what I think is an incredibly powerful moment between Mark and Steven. Like you're saying when Steven, who's the one that's always mad at Mark, right? He's like, Oh, you don't, you don't love me. And like you're saying, Mark's kind of looking at out for him Mm -hmm. the whole time. But then when Steven finally looks at him realizing how awful what happened to Mark was and that he was created and he's not the original and all this stuff. And through all of that, Steven look at him going, you were just a kid, Mark. It's not your fault. Like, it's okay. I have chills right now. I get really heartbroken at that part. And so the execution there is, is we just don't have very many moments like that. I think that's right. And uh, man, I, I, that is like even beyond the the DID of it. It's such a. It's just a really bold story to tell. Like I'm thinking of episode five in particular in so mm-hmm. many ways, and I think it is really beautiful, even just from a, a, a perspective of exploring how you feel about yourself and and the the conversations right. you have with yourself even, even if you don't as, have DID right right it's like I'm thinking of the like let's talk about the self-talk maybe and just yeah Spider-Man it's, it's a uh, yeah I I think that something I want to talk about here at the end but I, I won't disrupt is just the way because I agree mostly with with everything you're saying here I, I want to talk about the way that this was received not just not critically, but just the impact that it had versus maybe the impact that it could have or, or should have had in, in light of everything that we're discussing. But I'm going to put a pin in that for now and and because I feel like you have more, more okay. points that I want to cover. Okay, this is where this breaks down a little bit because I do want to come back to a couple things you talked about and I want to come back to what you just said. I'll, I'm down to talk about that too in a second. I'm going to go real quick all the way back. You were talking about the post credit scene and how long has Jake been there and the mystery there. Oh, and right. I think that's another one of those things that you're not supposed to understand fully. I, I hadn't caught the first couple times watching Moon Knight how often they actually do reference, quote, how many personalities are in there. Mm-hmm. Like Harrow says, and who knows who else is in there. Um, I think the first time, obviously, it clearly puts the focus on Mark and Steven. But we don't even know if there's Jake and others. Like maybe mm-hmm. the person that's getting him back to his bed is another person. Maybe the person doing all the really violent killing is Jake or maybe it's somebody else. Obviously, with the sarcophagus member, that's another hint that there's another one that's important there. But there could mm-hmm. be even more than that with this kind of thing. And so as Conchu says in that post scene, who knows how many people Mark 
uh, Specter thought he was okay with. Um, and then what does that mean, right? For our character right. that we're following, he now has made amends with the two main ones, but there's a third like psychopath killer in there. I mean, right. Jake Lockley is willing to murder the hospital people. Because as they're walking oh, yeah. out, he killed yeah. – and those are not bad people, I don't think. And then to the confusion of the whole thing, that's a fascinating post credit scene to choose that Harrow's in a very, very similar-looking hospital as the one that Steven's in when he's in like his Mind Palace hospital. Mm -hmm. And so was that hospital real in the first place? It sure feels real because he goes outside and there's London. So I, it's strange. Like, right. That's a strange call to make that hospital be so reflective of the one that we think was just fake. Right. And and that's what I that's what I like about that scene or one of the things I like so much is that they do make that like they make that call but it's not it's not a definitive this is the hospital where things took place for Stephen and Mark but it it yeah it's so reminiscent that it could be. Okay. Which is so much of the show. The I'm sorry I'm talking so much. I know sometimes I, I let I let you go, but I'm just going here on this. Like I love this so much. Okay, there will be other episodes where you'll have your chance. I mean, Eternals, you kind of had more of a thing than I yeah. did. Here we go. Um, <laughs> my 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 final two things here. Well, they're not my final two. I always say my final two, and then it's never my final two. Um, <laughs> another thing I want to talk about really quickly is I love how Hisham Nazi came up with what I think is one of the coolest themes, most badass themes. The ba -da -da -da. Uh -huh. and he can just hit that multiple times throughout the series and you feel it like the first time right. you see him killing that jackal and he turns around it's da -da -da. and every mm -hmm. time he suits up and he does it slowly which is such a cool like suit up thing and he looks like a badass um, I'm into what that theme did besides that theme though with his choir work and stuff uh huh it's more of what we talk about with Ludwig Göransson, where he's creating a moment, he's creating a texture more than a singable, repeatable, listenable piece. Right. And yet his textures he cre he creates, I think, are so elite that I want to actually do something we never do in this podcast. I want to play you two clips. If you're watching, I'm going to play the actual video. If you're just listening, I want you to listen to the audio. Listen to the confusion he creates with the simplest sound ever. And I, to be honest, I got to say something. I'm not sure it is him or not. This might be a sound effect that someone else added because I couldn't find it on the actual score. But in hmm. the series, first scene, not only are you as a viewer so stunned at what is happening in that twist to kind of tie that all up together, listen to how the audio cue plays into that as well. Listen to the music in the background here while this is happening. Steven. Steven. That, um, <laughs> yeah. It's literally two notes on like a plucked string. Yeah. And that continues for minutes, like minutes at a time. It's just going bloom, bloom, and you're like yeah. on edge. All right. Man, in the tide to the wheelchair this. and the Moon Knight action figure. This is all while your mind's going, what the heck right, is happening? Right. But hear that like creepy, like. Uh -huh, uh -huh. Okay. And then the second thing he does in this second scene is listen, listen to this progression he comes up with. Everything reminds me. Everything reminds me. Reminds you Those four notes, Robbie, give me chills. Boo. Yeah. Boom. And I, look, I have chills right now. Look at this scene. That, hear that? Boom. 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 Like it makes you so on edge of what is happening. Man. And look how Harold's acting this. And I have noticed, all right, in our sessions, a pattern developing. Every time I ask you direct questions, you are triggered. I'm going to let this play so you can hear the music. Yeah. Many of us. And you're seeing these scenes of things he's been involved in? Uh -huh. Look at his face. You hear the music with those notes? Man. It's like Inception. Yeah. yeah. I can't help you if you don't help yourself. If you don't help yourself. 
<laughs> that line's repeated later, by the way. Are you hearing that music, Robbie? It's insane. Mark. Mark. Listen. Hey, hey now. If we can't calm me, listen to this. Listen, Robbie. Of your feelings, Mark. <sighs> Mark, listen, I, I know no, you're so right. I understand. And look at his acting. It's like creepy. I too have suffered from mental illness breaks in psychic and it's like cutting to the shots of all the things he knows. Followed by depression. I, I know what you're feeling. You can be healed. I know you can be healed. Come, oh, man. Mark, Get away from me. Mark, Mark, don't do this. You're only going to. Anyways, that's wild, man. Yeah. Yeah. No fair. So the genius of it, the acting, the visuals, but also the music to go boom, do, 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 yeah. and then keep building that. And then when he falls on the ground, he key changes it, uses the same notes in a different key with that building horns coming. And it's like, oh my yeah. gosh, that's what I mean by like, you would never pop that track on and be like, oh, let's study the music and listen to it. But when you're watching <laughs> the show, if you, if right. you, if you tune your ears into it, you're like, oh my gosh, this is unbelievably moving. It's so creepy and tension filled and it's four notes. Yeah. Thank you for going yeah, on that journey man. with me. No, I love that. And that's, that's such a good example of, of exactly what you're talking about, which <sighs> I, I think is like, that's always the that's not always something that you have uh, like a, a package deal that you have in one composer where they can have the memorable kind of anthemic moments and also like the ability to to create the atmosphere that he creates there which also like one of the nicest guys we've ever talked to oh, yeah. on the show which and makes he- me just root for it even more and he said that was his first demo. That yeah, that's what he came right, up with right. first. And they loved it. Yeah, such a cool thing. Yeah, and, and that was like one of the first times we ever did a like a Zoom call to Egypt, which was so cool. Oh, we true. did the interview yeah. from Egypt. Um I want to come back to my final point before I talk about the two caveats, okay? You mm-hmm. brought this up. I want to hear more of what you thought about the reaction to the DID part of it. Um, you said you had some interesting insight there. I don't know if you're going to add this. I I was surprised at two things. When the main twist of the show was that he had DID and you kind of realized he had gone through all this trauma and this was happening in episode five. So you knew as a viewer, there's not many other places they can go because there's only one episode left. Like, oh, the show is about him coming to terms with himself. Basically, right. when I realized that's what the show is about, I thought that was so cool to not make it about something way beyond that as much. Now, we'll talk about the finale in a second. Um, but also really important and moving that you're watching this superhero have to come to terms with his own mental health. And this was a crazy minority, but I was surprised to see – a few responses, like we remember we got some comments at the time of people being like, oh, he's soft and I just want to, like, can we just have a real superhero? Oh, yeah, and, right, and like, right. and then we got messages like that and I was like, oh my gosh, people think that? And then online there was some pushback with that stuff and I just, I guess I'm saying I'm surprised that people still don't see taking your mental health as a serious thing and as a healthy, cool, good thing, and that there's still negative reaction to that. So I think that was part of the dissension that was so confusing to me is that people didn't, not people, there was a small sect of people that are not okay enough emotionally to (laughs) be okay with the twist and realize the importance of it. And that's sad, I guess. Do you have anything to add on that? Because I remember that being a weird thing. Yeah, I do think this is one that I really think was driven by the the comics readers, although I also have like I, I always have to clarify. I don't think that these people that take issue with Marvel projects or any projects for not being comic accurate actually read very many comics. And I'm I'm not even like I'm I'm half joking and, and half serious. I think I have had conversations with people like people just, that I know that will say, oh, man, like I, I heard that this is like nothing like the comic. So I don't know if I'm even going to watch it. 
And I will ask, not even trying to trap them, just curious, like, oh, well, like, what comics have you read? And like, well, not really any, but I've read about, like, what the character's supposed to be on Reddit. And I've had that interaction multiple times, which, by the way, is totally fun. I have, <laughs> I've never been in the camp that, like, to really be a fan, you have to read the comics. I don't think that at all. But I do think that if you're going to come in with this, like, you know, righteous anger because it's departed from the source material, you should probably at least have familiarized yourself with the actual source material. I think that this show, to me, clearly pulls from elements of Moon Knight's publication history going all the way back to the beginning, and then obviously, most prominently, the, the Jeff Lemire, Greg Smallwood run that involves the kind of psych ward and all of that. The, the thing that has always made the character different at least as it's kind of shaped from batman or daredevil is the the did element of it and like the conchu element and these are the things that the show focused on the most like so we got a lot of time in, in egypt or a lot of things revolving around like egyptian culture and iconography and then we got a lot of time exploring this relationship between mark and steven and eventually jake and I think people, the sense that I got is that folks were upset that we didn't get a show more akin to Daredevil, but Moon Knight. Like Oscar Isaac in New York running along the rooftops, beating up bad guys, being really intense and violent and dark. And these are all things that we have seen in Moon Knight runs. But this kind of leads me to the only note that I wrote down after after this last watch is I I think that this show and, and maybe this reaction it's a larger conversation but we, we've talked so much about how phase four was unfairly in some ways compared to phase three when really what you're doing is is like I I was watching Daredevil season three uh, recently because we're covering that on friends from work plus and that show is so good and i still maintain it's it's that season is as good i think as anything that has come out on disney plus on the on the marvel side or maybe just period correct but and, and so i was coming in like i was watching that and moon knight at the same time as we were getting ready for this and i found myself thinking like oh man moon knight is so good I still don't know if it's as good as Daredevil season three. But then I was like, but that's not fair because I can't compare it to Daredevil season three. I need to compare it to Daredevil season one because that's where we're getting the, the first story told. We're getting like the origin. We're getting the introduction to the entire world. And I do think this is better than Daredevil season one. Like I look back and there are issues in that where like I, I don't I don't see exactly those issues in Moon Knight. And I think that that's kind of the larger issue here is like we're not like compare this to the first Thor movie, right? Or like compare this to the first the first Avenger or any of these like initial outings, even like the first Ant-Man, like movies that are are good or stories that are good. But then I think kind of get like built on and allowed to grow into something that one is interesting and different, but also like allows us to start seeing more things that we recognize in that character's mythology. And, and so I think that it's such a strange thing to watch six episodes that are essentially like the, the origin story of a character and maybe a franchise and be so mad that you didn't get, all of these things that you associate with decades of, of comics, like it, and, and I don't know, maybe this is not a totally new thing. I feel like there was some of the same controversy around like Spider-Man homecoming, you know, for that, not having these elements that people would associate with Spider-Man. Sure. I think that where that story ultimately went with, with no way home or just the MCU as a whole is kind of the, the perfect example of why, <laughs> you need to to maybe sit back and see what's what might come of it again like what's interesting here is that we we don't know whether moon knight is continuing on or not but i think that if it's allowed to 
it will be a much more interesting part of the MCU because of this. Like, do we really want a Moon Knight show that is just like an angry, vengeful guy that's like running through back alleys that's motivated by like just this general sense of justice? Well, I don't, but okay, some points in response. I mean this gracefully, and I don't mean this pointed at you, okay? So I'm going to say you, but I'm not talking to you in particular. I know you don't think this way. But on one hand, when you say the, I was thinking about is Moon Knight comparable to Daredevil Season 3, I agree with your point that, yes, this is the origin, and so we can go on all that for sure. But also, I guess as the rankings guy, this is weird for me to say, I don't really care. I don't care. I don't. I still liked it. I don't sure. then have to immediately go, okay, but now from any project that's ever come out, is it better than that? Is it worse than that? Like, I don't have to spend my time thinking that. Again, I'm not saying that to you. Right. I'm just saying I don't have to think about that side of it. And I know we've talked about this following point multiple times on this podcast, but I do think that this is one of those times where knowing nothing of the comics actually helps – me as a viewer, because I don't have, it's hard to explain. I don't have any of those expectations. And we get some listeners that sometimes critique me for that. Like, oh, he doesn't even know the comics. So, but I'm like, it's, it's your knowing of the comics that's leading you to send me the angry messages about how this wasn't how you thought it should have been. And again, I'm not belittling reading comics. And I think someone like Candace is right that she can find enjoyment in, in going to the movie and going, Oh, in infinity war, that's from this thing that I've now read. And Oh, I get, I recognize that character. So like I get there's positives, but in this particular case, when people are so mad that it's not the Batman style thing you're talking about, that's only coming from you having this preconceived notion that this character has to be a Batman style thing that you're thinking of when I don't even know who this character is. I've never even heard it ever mentioned. I'm, just watching this incredibly moving story of this guy having to come to terms with his past drama. <laughs> That's what I'm watching. Yeah. Well, it, it, it's a complicated question because it is an adaptation, right? So I don't think it's something that you like, I'm, I'm not going to go so far as to say, you know, y- you should treat this as its own thing entirely and any expectations are, are silly, which is not what I'm saying you're saying, but just because it's like, yeah, like, I think it's fair to go see, I, I think we've said this before, but, like, I think it's fair to go see Lord of the Rings or Harry Potter or whatever and say, man, you know what? Like, what I loved about that book or books, like, I'm not seeing that here, and that's a bummer. I think okay, okay, that, okay. that I, I also think that's fair. I also think that's fair, but that is where the mis-expectation is coming from. So, like, if you don't have that expectation ahead of time, then you're not right. looking for that stuff, even if that's fair, to go read the adaption first. Yeah, yeah. No, well, and, and I guess, to me, what's... So I'm, not, I'm not belittling that they're disappointed. No, in no, I know. But I think what what's fair is saying, I don't think that this is is true to the spirit of the work that it's adapting. Like, that, I think, is a criticism that... I'm much more interested in exploring. I think Mm. what is so frustrating is that's not normally the criticism that we're dealing with here. Like that's a dialogue that, that you can have. This is more, Oh no, but in the comics, he is this way or like, this is what he does. He doesn't do this. And it's not about like the, the truth of the thing as a whole. It's about the the like factual accuracy almost, which is so strange when you're dealing with fictional it's, works. It's Daredevil having a sense of humor or having acrobatics, right? It's that it's that same right. kind of, where it's like you're right. choosing one run of Daredevil that he doesn't do that as much, but there are runs of Daredevil where he is acrobatic and has jokes. Well, and it's it's like any time you have a uh, an adaptation or a a kind of based on a true story movie, like mm-hmm. like Oppenheimer, right? Mm -hmm. Everything that happens in that movie, like, that's not exactly how everything happened. And that's not what Christopher Nolan is saying. But what Christopher Nolan is doing is he has this one window of of time, like the three-hour time you're in the theater, and also the amount of time that he's willing to cover and able to cover within that story without it feeling bloated. And he's going to probably, yeah, pull, like, a moment from a different context into this 
that didn't necessarily happen, maybe change the order a little bit, because then whenever you stand back, it gives you a clearer sense of who this person was, of what happened. And it's truer, even if it is less factually accurate. And I think that we have a hard time holding both of those things at the same time. But I think we really have to, especially when it comes to adapting fictional things. There is a way to more clearly. Even that's a funny example, though, because there is an actual fact of what happened out there in the ether. Like those were true events that happened. But this is like you're you're yeah, you're basing on a fictional writing and multiple fictional writings, like sometimes hundreds yeah. Well, and it's it's funny because that's the that's what I've learned is it's the same thing with the the Spider-Man fan crew and their obsession with Peter being married to Mary Jane, which is not something that even came about until Spider-Man had been around for 20 plus years, you know, and, and so it's like but it, it's a particular moment that people decide is it like that is the thing because that's what. I gravitated towards at some point or think that I would gravitate towards based on my Reddit summary that I've read. And so here it's, yeah, it's funny because a lot of the things, and maybe this will transition us to the, to the finale, because I know you have one more point there, but some of the like gods and monsters type things that maybe people didn't like as much because they wanted it to be more like noir. That is, I mean, the very beginning of Moon Knight. Like, one, Moon Knight obviously debuted in a, a comic called Werewolf by Night, which we've now been introduced to via the MCU, too. But then, like, even the first kind of adventures that we had with Moon Knight in his own book, he was dealing with these kind of supernatural things. Like, and and so maybe you're like, yeah, but those aren't my favorite Moon Knight comics. And it's like, okay, but we're... <laughs> like They exist. We're talking... Yeah, they exist. And we're talking about an adaptation. And so now you're it, it it just starts to feel like a bad faith argument whenever you really get into it and you realize that I think to come all the way back around to how you open this, it's not it's like She-Hulk, like the arguments against She-Hulk where people were like, oh, man, this is crazy. What is the MCU doing? It's like and then you look at She-Hulk comics and it is the I think one of the most effective adaptations in in marvel comics to screen history like you realize that people are not complaining because it's not comic accurate people are complaining because they don't want a a show that's focused on a woman in this way and the same thing here people are are complaining not because it's not comic accurate but because they don't want you're right like a, a meditation on like the whether it's did or just like trauma mental yeah, well, and, and, and you know, like, again, the way that we kind of interact with, with ourselves and the guilt and, and shame that we can carry and how that then, like, creates well, a cycle. And, and I do. That's why I like right. this one. I right. like that more. I'm going back to your original premise. They had I think two a lot choices. of people do, by the way. They, yeah, I think so, too. They had a choice. What's a more interesting story on paper? A guy who runs the streets beating up bad people for the sake of vengeance and justice. Or this. And I to me, on paper, it's always this. A guy who has this, 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 this disorder that he's wrestling with himself in the past trauma. And, like, you can create some really moving moments out of that. Mm-hmm. Like, to me, there's no contest on that. We've had, we have so many different adaptations of a superhero just inflicting justice. I mean, going back to the 1950s, you can right. find stuff like this, Okay. And in general, before superheroes, you could find this probably in ancient, you know, literature with Hercules. So it's like, oh, I, yeah. I, I, and I like just, Westerns. Th- yeah. This is a more culturally relevant, poignant show. Um, okay. Obviously, I love it. We're going to close this out. For Can me, I say one more thing, actually? Yes, yeah, please. To, to that point, I, I'm just, I think that the other, it's interesting to view the show in the context of Oscar Isaac's career Hmm. and how like he was he was in uh, the apocalypse Mm x-men movie you know which was i think his first foray into superhero stuff that did not go well and and in a lot of ways because i think it was that movie was i mean i i need actually i don't know if i want to rewatch that movie it was doing so many things we will rewatch it Maybe. I don't know if we... Well, we'll talk about yes, that. Yes, we but, will. I keep uh, going. Yeah. 
but yeah, so I, I, I think it's interesting that he had that experience. He then had the Star Wars experience. And I feel like I, I remember reading interviews with him 100%. when Moon Knight was coming out and that he was really – he had kind of been burned some yes. by both being part of these like blockbuster mega things where his – it didn't really matter what he brought to it. Like ultimately, creatively, it was he was just he was a piece that then, you know, this thing becomes whatever it is that they want it to be. And I I got the sense that that frustrated him. And he so wasn't going to do it unless, unless it was like this. He wasn't. Yeah, exactly. And and then I think when you look at the series and by the way, not we're, we're talking about it like it's, you know, the, do, just doing this this good work that you kind of sit there and like strap in for. But obviously it's a really fun, really funny series. And I think that what I also appreciate from Isaac's perspective is it is still doing a really interesting thing with the idea of a superhero. Like not, not like it's just interesting because it's unique and we haven't seen a character like that. Although that's certainly true. It's also interesting in that it's just subverting what these motivations are like the the whole conversation about justice being kind of anticipatory versus uh, retributivist like this is at, at kind of the core of this idea that we started in the MCU with the Avengers and us talking about like these uh, some of the it's like a, a delving deeper into some of the debates that we started with the Winter Soldier and Civil War about like what is like a, a valid and appropriate use of power and what should the motivation be and what is the kind of individual v worth versus the the collective. And it's like, these are all things that I think are really like, if you're going to explore some interesting questions, I think these, these are the ones we wind up coming back to a lot in superhero stories. And so I think that like, I, what's what I like about this show is it, it achieves everything that we've talked about it achieving throughout this entire episode, but also in a way that I think really furthers the development of of superhero TV and film and stories, period. Uh, I, OK, I totally agree. My final positive, real brief. I think it's low key one of the funnier shows in the MCU. And uh -huh. it's totally because it's my humor. This British office style, really quick. You have to have subtitles on to catch it type, uh -huh. you know, al almost like RDJ, like two people talking at the same time or like, like when I just have so many funny, I laughed out loud multiple times. Like when his boss says like, you're not a tour guide. And he's like, that really hurts. But anyways, <laughs> like that kind of stuff, like <laughs> that actually really hurts my feelings. Um, just so many funny little jokes, I think, that never feel oppressive. This is more my humor yeah. than like a shock humor of Guardians 2 or Deadpool, right? This is my yeah, style. Right. And I laughed out loud multiple times. The one um, that got me on this on this watch, and I think it's the first episode when Harrow first comes to the museum and he's like, <laughs> one, the, the line that I love is, you know, I'm at, do I know I'm at? No. No, not personally. Yeah, <laughs> that's, exactly. that's what I'm saying. Like that's my humor. Talking about being an avatar. And he's like, yeah, the, the blue people. And he's like, no. And he's like, oh, so the anime. <laughs> yeah. And then he goes, stop it, Steven. <laughs> that's what he says, <laughs> which I like. <laughs> yeah, there's there's a lot of moments. Um, I'm blanking on one right now, but later on, too, there's a couple like in the middle of a serious thing, but doesn't pull you out. A funny little right. comment here or there, you know. Well, um, and and one thing, not on the on the writing side, but on the uh, on the directing side, that I think is 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 fun as we're kind of talking about these relative Disney Plus projects. Is what are you going to go drink a couple of protein shakes? That's what Steven says to Mark. <laughs> <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> yes. Sorry, I uh, I love that to the extent you enjoyed this series, just the way that it like we're talking about the the episode four transition and just how well that's executed i think from a like there are a couple of moments in the mcu disney plus era where i've thought man like that's really good direction i think kate heron does that with loki i think mm. she is one of the strong components of that and so whenever it came out that she wasn't returning for season two i was initially a little worried by that 
But the fact that we now have stepping into her role, Moorhead and Benson, who were who directed about half of the episodes of Moon Knight, including episode four, makes me really excited because I I like a lot like they have clearly a lot of imagination. And mm-hmm. I think that this is a perfect like this has been a perfect avenue for that. And I think Loki could be that. As well. So as we're kind of getting closer and closer to Loki season two, I don't want to forget that we are going to see uh, those folks return into the the directing chair there. I think for the entire series. No doubt. My only drawbacks, I've said this so many times, I wish the actual special effects were better. There are a few scenes where not the idea of the costume or anything like that, but the actual animation of like the logs rolling down the hill. Um, mm-hmm. They don't look finished. And that bothers me. I don't have a lot of that in shows like Loki or WandaVision to me, but it happens here, which is such a bummer because of everything I just said <laughs> about the show. <laughs> so that's that's one drawback. And the only other drawback for me, knowing nothing of the comics, knowing nothing of the monsters, is... It is a little bit jarring. There's a slight weirdness to just interacting with a hippo goddess and like riding on a boat through a sand afterlife. And part of that's probably a cultural thing that I, you know, I wasn't raised in Egyptian culture to believe the field of reeds and stuff. So like, you know, it's all foreign to me. So it's probably some of that that's like, oh, I totally get that if you are in that culture. Um, But for me... It's a little bit weird. It's not enough to at all ruin the show, but that's a little drawback for me. When you talk about the giant monsters at the end, that never bothered me because it felt like in Mm -hmm. the finale, what people miss is like, one, a lot of the finale is not about the giant monsters, first of all. A lot lot of it it. is. I forgot how much. And secondly, like, I'm kind of a little bit like, where did you think we were leading? I mean, this is what we were leading up to the whole show. He talks about freeing Amit for hours. So why is that surprising to you a little bit? And lastly, I think the final thing about the monsters that actually sits really well with me is on this watch, you you realize that nobody sees Khonshu the whole show except for Mark or other right. avatars. So right. no one is able to see that. And I think at the very end, even when Amit and Khonshu are like pyramid size and fighting, I don't uh-huh. think they're visible to people. So I kind of like the idea that it's still like this in the background, like people in Cairo don't know the threat. And that's a little bit different than like Eternals for me, where Mm -hmm. this is like people are going to be like, wow, the sun got messed up. And, you know, and the stars did this weird turning thing. But that's all they would know. That's all they would know in the end. So like in a weird way, while the ramifications almost felt too big, I think Mm -hmm. there are a couple little details that help it feel smaller in my mind. Yeah, I no, I think I think that's right. And I I will say just since you brought it up, that is the one thing that I that I get a little hung up on here. Yeah, it doesn't ruin it for me, but I do I think that the way the the hippo goddess was approached, it is like a little silly at certain at certain mm-hmm. times to where I just I I could see a I like the the use of humor, but I don't I don't find myself laughing at that character very much. And I feel like there are a couple of moments where I'm supposed to and I don't. And I'm like, I wonder if there was just a different approach there. If we could have had like maybe a a different like would it have been better if we had like the the more like a, a serious character for Mark and Steven to then kind of bounce off as the like the person that takes their job very seriously and then they get to be the comedic relief against that. I wonder if that would have been a little bit stronger. I do love where it goes with Layla and then we kind of get her working as the avatar. And so I think that I would have liked, like, I, I I think I like it on paper. I just, yeah, the, the way that I don't know if it's the performance or just the, the way that that relationship was supposed to be conceived between her and Mark and Steven, but, that yep. is probably like my biggest. It's a little off puttingly silly. Yeah. I, but, but I will say I'm, I'm 90% there with you where I would only push back. And it's not even a pushback is like, I do get a couple of chuckles out of 
some of the moments where she's trying to interact with Layla and like speaking from those other dead people or when they're first fighting about being coming the avatar. And then I do oh, like right. the payoff of how badass Layla is once she has the wings and stuff for sure. Um, but I'm with you. Something about it is off putting and not in like an endearing way for, for the most part. So here's the thing for me. WandaVision on both the critic side and the preference side, it's the number one on both sides of things because I don't think I have some of these critical questions that I just had that I get from some of these other series. And mm-hmm. I felt all of the moments as heavy as this. Um, I would say that like when you isolate like a single biggest twist or like wow moment, the moments that I just think about with Disney Plus that I love – it's, it's the Loki finale. It's Loki uh-huh. trying to explain to Mobius, like, what? We messed up. We messed up. And panning right, over and right. seeing the statue of Kang. That's one of the moments for me of like, oh, my gosh. It's this. It's episode four of what is happening here. And it's maybe not a single singular isolated moment with WandaVision, but I had it every week with WandaVision. Oh, so, right. Yeah. And, and maybe, honestly, the moment that makes me feel as heavily as Mark with his mother is Wanda saying goodbye to Vision with that music we talked about with Christoph Beck. So it, there's some comparables there. I'm, I personally am going to finally end up on, on the critic side of things going WandaVision – Loki, because it doesn't have some of these concerns I just mentioned, although it does have a few acting things, and then Moon Knight 3. That's my critic side, but on preference okay. side, I've swapped them. I am WandaVision, I see. Moon Knight, Loki for preference. I, I think I like this show more than Loki, just preference. Yeah. No, I think that's fair. Well, I've really enjoyed the the stage of the rewatch with our mm-hmm. kind of like what's going on behind the scenes phase after after the reflection. And next week, I've been looking forward to revisiting Thor: Love and Thunder. With You've been looking you forward to it for years <laughs> for a long, a long time. So that's going to be super fun. So if you're following along with us, that is what we'll watch this week. I'm going to. I'll post something. This is maybe a good reason to check the newsletter about when we're going to be watching that. It may need to be slightly later uh, than than we have before, but we'll touch base there. But it will be Thursday night uh, before we, we record Friday morning. So that is where we're heading. And then, of course, the week after that, we will finish with Loki Season 1, which will also feature our spoiler-free preview of Loki Season 2, which mm-hmm. we'll then start covering next week. So really maybe fun even, stuff. Maybe even screeners of Loki this week. Who knows? Crazy. And maybe you'll come in guns a-blazing next week like I did today for Love and Thunder. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> That's right. Let's see. Thank you for listening. Please check out our website, theffwpodcast.com. Hit us up on all social media at the FFW Podcast. And most importantly, please rate, review, and subscribe to this podcast or YouTube channel wherever you're watching or listening. We are so thankful for you. Thank you. We'll see you next time. Bye. Bye.